This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. It's decision day for the Fed with bond traders positioning for the central bank to dial back its rate cut projections. In Asia, stocks rise after U.S. equities touch fresh record highs. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is back in the Middle East. This week's trip is his sixth since October as tensions in Israel continue. Plus, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Africa's biggest, says its IPO drought is finally easing. We'll bring you our interview with the CEO shortly. It's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Welcome to Fed Day. It's all eyes on the dot plot later. Will it be more hawkish and will markets care? Let's check in on these markets as we await that decision. We'll bring you analysis throughout the programme. You've got the MSCI Asia Pacific Index in the green this morning after a positive close on Wall Street yesterday, propelled by the Magnificent Seven. The, the MSCI Asia Pacific Index, I should note, is excluding Japan. They're taking a day off. I wish I could take a day off after every big decision, but there you go. You've got futures stateside pointing to a lower opening today, as they are in Europe. And if we flip the board to the cross-asset picture, you did see Treasuries pushing higher yesterday, thanks to this strong 20-year auction. No cash Treasuries trading, as I say, until 11 a.m. Dubai time, because Japan is closed. But meanwhile, you've got the dollar pretty steady, having climbed for a fourth day. How much would a dovish Powell presser knock the green back, you have to ask. You've got Brent trading at $87 a barrel, so edging lower after a two-day rally. But how high could it go on Fed cuts? Jeff Curry tells us past 90, and we'll bring you the latest from Sierra Week in Houston later in the show. Just finally, a check on Bitcoin. $62,000 is where we trade, taking a beating and well off the highs we've seen of late. But let's check in on how Asia markets are faring. Of course, it was a big day with the BOJ yesterday for Japan. Avril Hong's on standby in our Singapore studio. Hey, Avril. Hey, Lizzie. A big day for the BOJ yesterday, but it's also a big day ahead of that Fed countdown, really watching to see what we're going to get from the most influential central bank in the world that's going to be of consequence for Asian equities. So far, you're seeing a bit of a bump up, uh, and it's thanks to what we saw on the tech side of things on Wall Street. Similar picture, uh, the likes of Tencent, for example, their reports earnings uh, today, they're, you know, there's some optimism being priced in that stock is also higher. But we did get the Chinese loan prime rate left unchanged as expected after the PBOC left the MLF unchanged last week. For the bond markets, that doesn't seem to matter. It's really about that expectation of further easing or the speculation going forward. Yields just keep dropping, unchanged at the moment, but still at that 228.5 level. Now, let's flip the board. I want to recap what we're getting out of Japan. Of course, it was the historic rate decision and then Nueda not letting on very much. The takeaway for markets was that it's going to be keeping things accommodative. Uh, any tightening or normalization is going to be very gradual. So equities market pointing to a gain at the open based on the futures. We're seeing the bond futures pull back a little. Uh, yen, of course, that one is uh, the weakest level against the greenback since November last year. So it's really going to be shifting the focus to the Fed. And indeed, we will continue that focus now. Thanks, Avril, for that update on Asia markets. The Fed decision very much in focus. It's expected to hold rates today, so all eyes on the dot plot and whether we might get a surprise on the balance sheet as well. The press conference also in focus. Let's now bring in Mary Nicola for some analysis. Mary, what are you expecting today? Yeah, the big thing is going to be on how how the shift in the dot plots take place. Do we get that shift from three to two? Obviously, if we do, then we're going to see um, a, a, a hawkish response from the market. Um, although a lot of bond traders are already skewed for a more hawkish uh, outcome from the Fed. So really, the big risk for the market is if the Fed comes out a lot more dovish than expected. Um, and they could do so, especially in the press conference. So let's say they shift that dot plot from three, high, three cuts to two cuts, then all of a sudden you're going to see uh, the markets respond. And then, uh, of course, you'll see a, a, 
uh, let's say, a, d a more dovish press conference from Powell, keeping an op the optionality open um, that he needs if it, he needs to cut, especially if um, the data deteriorates further. Yeah, because some were surprised by Powell's comment that the Fed's not far from the level of confidence they need on inflation to start lowering rates. If you do get a dovish Powell today, how uh, big could the market reaction be? Yeah, given how the market is skewed currently in terms of very much focused on a, bear, uh, a much more uh, hawkish Fed, uh, the rally could be quite big, where you can see not only pressure on the dollar, but also uh, yields can start drifting a lot lower than we would we would have expected uh, from from such a surprise. So, um, right now, I think the the focus will continue to be the continue to be on what, how his comments project, because again, as uh, as he mentioned um, just a, a few weeks ago uh, to Congress, that they don't need. The, the inflation targeting the target going back to two percent they just need to see disinflationary pressures continue and as long as that does happen over the next few months we could see uh, ourselves a lot closer to the rate cut so there's no way that the that Fed chair Powell is going to close um, the door on on any cuts um, sooner rather than later or or just uh, on, and, or even put a time frame on it all right, Mary Nicola from our M Live team. Great to have you on, and you can check out the M Live blog at M L I V Go on the terminal. Let's continue this conversation. We'll bring in Lucy Baldwin, CT's global head of research. Lucy, joining us from Hong Kong, you're looking at this dot plot too. If it's more hawkish, do you expect that the stock market could just shrug it off? Actually, as a sign that the economy is growing in the eyes of the Fed. Yes, it's a big question indeed. I mean, our view really is that we are going to see today uh, a difficult environment for the Fed to give comfort that they are going to, to do as many cuts as has previously been expected by the market. Now, that said, our core view is that you do still get 125 basis points of cuts this year, which is different to consensus. Uh, our view is the economy is pretty hot. Uh, there's been a big debate around whether the data so far this year is a red herring or a red flag. But but I think that data is going to make it very difficult for them to signal uh, you know, a cut before June. So I think that the moves we've seen um, do, do correspond to that difficulty, that this last mile of inflation is incredibly difficult to get back down. It is proving to be pretty sticky. I like it, bringing us a contrarian call to wake us up in the morning, Lucy. Good stuff. Let's focus on the balance sheet as well. How much more do you think that the Fed can shrink its asset portfolio before potential market disruptions, like we saw with the repo market blow-up in 2019? Well, as you say, there's been a number of different disruptions around the world uh, as it pertains to the balance sheet. And as we know, U.S. debt seems to be growing by about a trillion dollars every hundred days or so. Uh, and like many of these things, it's not an issue till the moment it becomes an issue. Um, so right now, markets are just incredibly focused on rates coming down and obviously on the AI boom. So we don't think there's a major problem with U.S. debt. But obviously, as we press towards the second half of the year and look to the election, uh, everybody's going to be wondering what happens given the two candidates that we've got coming up and the likelihood of wanting some kind of fiscal stimulus again, albeit much less than we would have seen over the course of the last few years. Yeah, I maybe want to come back to the election, but let's just stick on this AI boom, because in terms of the stock market rally, you're pretty bullish. You think that the S&P could go as high as 5,700 by the end of this year. What's it going to take to make that happen? Well, and as you say, despite our cautionary view on the on the economy in the second half, we do still see a, a blue sky scenario of 5,700. It is a bit of a Goldilocks scenario, so you really do need to see for that to materialise that softer landing and something like two or three cuts uh, and obviously that the, the US 10-year to come down lower is really what we'd need to see for that as well as that earnings progression. There's an awful lot resting on the AI capex boom for sure, given tech is now 20% of earnings, about 30% of the index and has been more than half of the performance. 
performance we've seen, uh, there is a lot of pressure for it to continue. But it's going to take a long time for us to know whether the capex that's going to be spent is being spent productively. So we definitely say to people, even those concerned of a bubble merging, uh, you'd want to participate in that. You'd want to own some of that exposure. And as it broadens out beyond the obvious AI names, you'd want to own that, as well as probably having a barbell strategy just in case and owning some value uh, in certain parts of the world too alongside that. Well, is this the sort of justification you need when you have NVIDIA announcing its Blackwell, Blackwell platform yesterday? Does that kind of give you the justification for the unabated AI enthusiasm we're seeing in markets? Well, we are pretty bullish on the sort of semi-cap equipment space in particular. So it was uh, great to see uh, NVIDIA commenting on the new generation of chips yesterday. And for us, we do think that that chip war, that race for the world's most critical technology, is going to continue as obviously China looks to become um, self-sufficient and self-reliant in that space. And obviously the US looks to also take back more capacity and build more capacity itself. We do see at that very high end of uh, the semiconductor industry a tremendous race for that dominance for now the US obviously has a clear advantage and obviously Nvidia in that design space has a clear dominance within its own market as well and we do think that's going to take some some beating but we do think that's a very compelling space to own for investors for the next few years if we could just look back to yesterday, Lucy, of course, we had the Bank of Japan decision. You weren't expecting the BOJ to hike till April, but now that they have, do you think that's it, one and done for 2024? Well, we do think there is now going to be this normalization. You obviously had a very strong set of inflation data coming through from Japan in terms of the, the wage negotiations over spring. Uh, and we do think that sort of slow and steady normalization is now set to, to continue. Again, with our view on the Fed for those cuts in the second half of this year, it will be difficult to see material hikes from the Bank of Japan. But we do think you're going to see that normalization slow and steady, which gives us a lot of confidence, actually, that the equity market looks still very attractive here given the corporate reform agenda, very strong earnings growth coming through and a pretty compelling valuation still relative to the rest of the world. So we would still say you can party like it's 1989 with Japan equities for now. You weren't here in 1989, Lucy. Let's just finally talk about elections. You mentioned the political risk. Are markets underpricing the geopolitical and political risk that will be bubbling along in the background this year? Well, I think there are a number of risks for markets this year. Inflation is obviously one of them. And I think one of the risks that's perhaps less well understood there is that risk that at some point do people worry about hikes even coming back from the Fed if you can't get inflation close enough back to, to 2%. Obviously, that's not really in anybody's minds now. The recession risk I talked about is pretty much off the table. And then, as you say very rightly, the third risk that markets aren't really yet focusing on is election risk and that broader sort of new world order and geo politics and I think obviously both candidates um, have, have been you know are incumbents it's Trump 2.0 or Biden 2.0 and so there's a lot of debate around what does that mean for global trade and and the sort of uh, the forward pattern there so I think you're not really going to see markets start to price that until we move back towards the sort of second half of this year but for us uh, we would look at something like the dollar as a way of playing that because we do think you'll likely see some dollar strength coming back as you go back into the the second half of this year. OK, so complacency, but perhaps justifiable complacency. Lucy Baldwin, City Global Head of Research. Great to have you on the programme. Thank you. Now, I have, we have talked about the Fed decision coming up, but there's plenty more on the docket today. It's a busy one. We've got UK CPI data at 7 a.m. UK time. That's 11 a.m. Dubai time. And, of course, it's going to be absolutely crucial for the Bank of England decision, but not really likely to persuade the MPC to give us more details on the future path for rate cuts when it meets tomorrow. Uh, it's expected to add to the evidence this figure that inflation is on a steady path back to the BOE's 2% target. Economists see a drop from 4% to 3.5% and that would be driven by food, core goods and services. But it's not just the UK that's dropping an inflation print. We've also got South Africa's CPI at 12pm Dubai time. Most economists reckon that it will have ticked up in February. Bloomberg Economics, however, 
however, it sees a slight drop down to 5.2%, and that would be thanks to a fall in food prices. We're also going to hear from the ECB president, Christine Lagarde. Then, on Thursday, we're going to have a bonanza of central bank decisions. We've got, uh, at 4pm Dubai time, as I say, the BOA, BOE expected to hold rates as well, uh, keeping an eye, though, on whether the vote split is more dovish this time. Do we lose Jonathan Haskell from the High King camp? Then, at 3pm Dubai time, we get Turkey's decision, expected to hold the one-week repo rate at 45%, but continuing to tighten reserve requirements and banking regulations there. We get a Norges Bank decision at 1pm Dubai time. They're expected as well to hold borrowing costs. So the focus is on the outlook for when the cuts start. Same story as everywhere else, but most economists don't see them coming sooner than the third quarter. And then we have the SNB deciding at 12.30pm Dubai time. They're expected to hold at 1.75%. It's more of a holding party than a pivot party for now. But still ahead, we're going to discuss the outlook for oil and why MUFG expects Turkey's central bank to hold. That's up later in the hour. But first, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken is going to make his sixth visit to the Middle East since the Israel-Hamas war broke out in October. We'll have more on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Now, the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken is making his sixth visit to the Middle East since the Israel-Hamas war broke out, with stops in Saudi Arabia and Egypt on the docket. The top US diplomat has called on Israel to let more aid into Gaza, saying the situation is worse than Sudan and Afghanistan. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Stuart Livingston Wallace now. Stuart, with Blinken calling for more aid, could you just give us some context on how this compares to other crises in terms of humanitarian aid? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the numbers are pretty horrific. So thinking about Sudan, it's something like 80% of the population in need of aid. Afghanistan, it's 70%. But as he said yesterday, Gaza, it's 100%. You know, there's virtually no one uh, that is well supplied. So. They're all terrible crises, uh, and in some respects this is the worst because it's going to be the toughest to get the aid in. Mm -hmm. So you can fly stuff into Sudan and, and Afghanistan, you just can't do that. As you've seen, they've basically had to resort to airdrops. You've got a few trucks coming in from the south, but there's no grand plan that's going to materialise any time soon to get the kind of the volume you need to solve the situation or at least alleviate it. And you would want to have eyes on the situation reporting it, but is there any hope that journalists will be able to enter Gaza? Uh, not any time soon. Uh, and I mean, you know, as, as Blinken pointed out, there are some good reasons for that, which is that it is an unbelievably dangerous area to operate in. Mm. And we know that, you know, lots of journalists have, have already been killed in this conflict. Um, so uh, we know that there are some embeds going in with the IDF, uh, but again, it's on a very limited capacity. They can only see what the IDF wants to show them. And, and, and again, the, obviously, the IDF is going to be very cautious about taking too many press in because you really don't want a, a delegation of journalists killed. Yeah, you might as well watch an IDF-made social media video in that case. Um, and then just in terms of the relationship between the US and Israel, you've got the, the Israeli delegation headed to Washington. Is the feud easing? Um, I think they're, they're, like I, it's I, easing, but I, I, not. I think they're trying to improve the optics, which is not the, at all the same thing as saying Quite. things are improving. I mean, fundamentally, you have two opposing positions here that I think are almost irreconcilable. So they are trying to dial back the rhetoric, and you can understand why they would want to do that. There's not much to be gained. You know, they've kind of said what they want to say. We know Netanyahu is, is sending a delegation to Washington to listen to the U.S. proposals for how you could tackle the Hamas problems in Rafah without a ground assault. But again, he has said very explicitly again and again, and as recently as yesterday, he thinks that is the only option to deal with us. But what are you hearing? Is there any chance that this push into Rafa won't go ahead? Uh, based on everything that's been said so far, no. Uh, I, I think what, what the best we can hope for is probably a delay. So in other words, you can put enough pressure on Israel to do something about the civilian population in Rafa, and again, that's well over a million people. 
Uh, again, no one's come up with a very concrete plan for how you deal with that, but that, I think, fundamentally, we're sort of in a delay situation mm -hmm. rather than scrapping it completely. But you never know. You know, maybe that delegation in Washington hears something that they like that they can work with, and we don't end up in that position. Clearly, that's what everyone would hope for. But right now, it's not looking great. Yeah, a bleak situation in terms of the situation for people in Gaza, but buying Biden time as well, politically, because of the attacks from the left in the US. Stuart Livingston Wallace, thank you for that update on the situation in the Middle East. Let's take a look at some of the other corporate stories that we're looking at today in the region. Saudi Arabia is reported to be planning a massive push into artificial intelligence. The New York Times says the kingdom's considering a fund of about $40 billion, which could make it among the biggest players in the sector. Representatives of the Saudi Public Investment Fund have also reportedly discussed a potential partnership with Andreessen Horowitz and other financiers as well. Bourse Dubai is set to sell roughly a third of its stake in US exchange operator Nasdaq, raising as much as $1.6 billion. The Middle Eastern company will be left owning just over 10% of Nasdaq and will drop down to become its second largest shareholder. The Bourse Dubai CEO says the firm will continue to be a long-term shareholder in the tech exchange. We've got lots more ahead, so stay with us. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. Industry is well capitalized, has good liquidity. Believe me, from last year to this year, people short up their liquidity across the industry. Uh, commercial real estate is a slow burn. It's a classic burn. In other words, if you go back in the late 80s and early 90s, we had a rolling commercial real estate recession. And, and so there'll be difficulties and we work in that. But you know, the, the trading attitude, which is these assets got to move at a price tomorrow morning, isn't the way the banking system works. And frankly, that's the, the value of the banking system. We work with clients. We figure out what the, you know, you take a building, you figure out what the ultimate end state uh, rental roles will provide. You refinance it. Sometimes that wipes out the equity. Sometimes it doesn't. We're careful in how we underwrite as an industry. You know, the top 30 banks go through the stress test, which has a, a an effect that says, wait a second, if you're out uh, underwriting out in an odd way, that will, you have to put up the capital to prove your right before you even get the chance to prove your right. So in other words, your capital requirements reflect your underwriting today, even though recession may never come. And it reflects your underwriting commitments under a scenario where commercial real estate drops by 30 or 40 percent instantaneously. Instantaneously. So there's an effect on that on the industry, which is much more conservative building and much more middle of the road building, which is probably slow down the capital provision to some of these uh, companies. But on the other hand, it's not a bad thing when you get to this point. So I, we feel very good. Does that mean banks might fail? There's been thousands of banks have failed across the last 30, 40 years. That's what happens. Business models change. But on the other hand, the, the quality of the banking system is strong. Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan there speaking exclusively to Bloomberg Surveillance. We'll have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. It's decision day for the Fed, with bond traders positioning for the central bank to dial back its rate cut projections. In Asia, stocks rise after U.S. equities touched fresh record highs. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's back in the Middle East. This week's trip is his sixth since October, as tensions in Israel continue. Plus, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Africa's biggest, says its IPO drought is finally easing. We'll bring you our interview with the CEO shortly. A very good morning. It's just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Welcome to Fed Day. It is all eyes on the dot plot today. Will it be more hawkish and will the market care? If we check in on equities as they're faring currently, Japan is closed after the BOJ decision. So if you strip that out, the MSCI Asia Pacific Index higher a quarter of a percent, getting a boost from last night's close on Wall Street, which was boosted by the, M the Magnificent Seven. But as we look ahead to the Wall Street Open, futures pointing to a lower opening as they are in Europe. If we flip over to the cross-asset picture, you did see Treasuries pushing higher yesterday thanks to a strong 20-year auction, but no cash Treasuries trading till 11 a.m. Dubai time because, as I say, Japan is closed. The dollar is currently pretty steady, having climbed for a fourth day, but how much would a 
dovish Powell presser affect the greenback? That's a question to ask. Brent trading at $87 a barrel, so edging lower after a two-day rally. How high could it go on Fed cuts? Jeff Curry says past 90, and we'll bring you the latest later in the programme from Sierra Week in Houston. Just finally, Bitcoin taking a beating, now below the $62,000 mark, well off the highs that we've seen of late. But let's broaden out now. Let's go to Asia. Several Hong is waiting for us in Singapore. Avril, what's happening where you are? Yeah, Lizzie, we see that gain slightly on the MXAPJ, uh, and that is helped along by what we're seeing on South Korean stocks, particularly Samsung Electronics, as it gains by the most in six months. And this is in turn from a report that NVIDIA is looking to buy its high bandwidth memory chips. So that's that you know, chip maker sprinkling a bit of that fairy dust onto a South Korean counterpart. Uh, let's flip the board and take a look very quickly at what we're seeing cross assets in China as well because, of course, we had that loan prime rate left unchanged today. This was as expected after the PBOC did the same last week. But you get the sense that for Chinese equities, we might have seen the bottom. Uh, the CSI 300 and Hang Seng running slightly higher today. The bonds earlier were extending the gains. That's stalling a little now. Uh, but overall, it looks like a bit of an improvement, Lizzie. All right, Avril Hong, we thank you for that update. Now, oil is going to rise above the consensus view of $70 to $90 if the Fed cuts rates in the coming months. That's the view of Carlisle's group, Carlisle Group's Jeff Curry, and he spoke to Bloomberg on why he's bullish on oil and copper. The U.S. is running a 6% fiscal deficit, the largest deficit ever ran history in a peacetime, non-recessionary environment. And think about this. If they do it in a recession, it's because it's providing, let's say, unemployment insurance. They're doing it full employment, red-hot economy, and they're turbocharging an environment that is already being stressed. That's why Bitcoin and commodities are the two best-performing asset classes out there. Well, let's get another view on that. And we can bring in Asan Koman, who's head of commodities, ESG and EM research at MUFG. Welcome to the program, Asan. Could oil break past $90 a barrel if we have more Fed cuts this year? Thank you, Lizzie, for having me. Absolutely. We, we certainly agree with, with Jeff's view there. I think, you know, we still remain tactically bullish. I think in terms of the recent advance, of course, it's been more incremental than remarkable. But with Brent now closer to 90 than 80, I think the complex is increasingly primed to test the 90 handle, and I think Fed rate cuts will be the next key catalyst. Of course, where we are right now, OPEC plus, key risk to the downside, it may conclude that further up by moves may hamper some of the long-term residue demand for its own barrels. So we would flag OPEC risks in terms of bringing more barrels to the market, in terms of reclaiming some of the lost market share by raising some of its production in the coming months ahead. OK, but with an eye on the dot plot later, how much would the Fed have to cut this year to get oil to $90 a barrel? So, Lizzie, I think, you know, when we look back in time, I think historically crude oil has been very well positioned going into as well as after Fed cuts, which, of course, is further reinforced right now with the complex constituting very tight micro fundamentals, which is, of course, market deficits that's been reinforced by the backwardation in terms of the futures curve. Now, I think today's setup, Lizzie, for us is strikingly reminiscent of the soft landing episode of 95, 96. The Fed eased only by 75 basis points back then amid a mid-cycle adjustment. Brent oil and broader commodities complex rallied by no less than 25% and 20% respectively. Now, I think with that in mind, we certainly hold conviction that today's environment does signify classic late cycle commodity price rally. And I think we look to be long energy and broader precious metals indeed with a historically strong gains when it comes to, uh, you know, coming into and out of the, the first initial uh, Fed cut. Thinking about the supply side as well, I'm sure you've had your ear to the Sierra Week conference that's been happening in Houston. What have been the standout highlights so far for you? Yeah, it's been a very interesting complex. I think in terms of you know trying to navigate this energy trilemma of so-called affordability, security, and sustainability, 
in terms of adjusting uh, a you know adjusting all the transition to net zero has been the key theme i think big oil has come into the conflicts you know very buoyed by the confluence of you know steadily rising oil prices you know supporting near record earnings we've got easing pressure from esg activism and of course no immediate signs of peak oil so i think with that in mind it's been certainly strong in terms of the big oil story now i think for us in terms of you know investments into green energy of course they have been growing quite significantly but for us they still remain too nascent lizzie for green capex alone to drive global growth so certainly i think that carbon intensive investment is needed to really try to minimize that structural underinvestment that's been going on for nearly a decade now Okay, so underinvestment, a real problem, both for clean and fossil fuel energy. Let's just come back to central banks, because we have got a bonanza of central bank decisions tomorrow, not just the Fed today. Turkey on the docket. What are the chances of a surprise hike, and what would that signal to you? Yeah, it's a key risk. I think for us, the base case is still for a hawkish hold from the Central Bank of Turkey. I think, of course, it may look to continue to gauge its impact of additional quantitative and macro prudential tightening that it's been doing for the last uh, few months. Of course, been a lot of pressure on inflation effects and reserves uh, across the country. Now, I think critically for us, it's not so much the decision, which we think it was likely to be on, on hold at 45, but it's the signal that comes out post-meeting statement. Now, I think for us, our base case is that an April rate hike is certainly on the table, and I think we look for that in terms of the, the post-meeting statement for that to come out uh, once, once the announcement is released. Well, that's interesting. So where is the ceiling for the policy rate, and when do you see the easing beginning? Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. I think for us, in terms of inflation dynamics, Lizzie, you know, it really hasn't shown no meaningful improvements in recent months. Of course, it's been more than eight months since the appointment of a new economic management team. Very, very strong in terms of reinforcing that investor sentiment that monetary tightening is continuing. But for us, two key reasons why we think that, you know, uh, inflation dynamics haven't really shown significant recovery. One, Lizzie, it's, you know, real interest rates remain deeply negative. And two, monetary tightening has really not been accompanied by fiscal tightening, particularly on a more restrictive incomes policy. So for us, I think trying to get to the central bank's estimate of a 36% year-end target for inflation is very unlikely. We look for it to be more closer to 50%. And for us, we've base cased a hike of another 250 basis points in the April meeting, taking, taking the one-week repo to 70, uh, 47.5%. Okay, that's your outlook for Turkey. Asan Koman, Head of Commodities, ESG and EM Research at MUFG. We thank you for shedding some light on a central bank that's perhaps forgotten in the shadow of the Fed and the BOJ, but not here on Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. Now, let's go to one of our top interviews. The Philippines President, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., thinks that GDP growth could hit 8% during his term. He's been speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin about the economy, and he also touched on interest rates and inflation. Much of much of the policies that we uh, that we uh, uh, taken on are are really to 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 spur growth. It, uh, that's part of the most that's the most important part because it is only growth that will pull us out of uh, this uh, the, the morass that was left after the pandemic. And uh, even in terms of inter even in terms of debt ratios, even in terms of uh, uh, unemployment, you know, even in terms of inflation, it really is growth it, it, that, 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 that seems to be the key. Is it sustainable if we continue down this road, if we defend all of the things that we are doing? I believe it is. Um, I believe it is. If we are also agile in terms of responding to the shocks that come up, come up uh, from, other, from, from the outside, uh, to put it that way, uh, shocks that we cannot control or can have very little influence over, if any. So that's the, that will be the key. It's a six-year term. Do you think you can get to 8% within oh. six years that you're in office? Sure. Why not? Um, uh, you know, uh, there, there's no... We plan. We always plan for the ideal. We don't plan for uh, a, a, a mediocre result. We plan for a very good result. Um, and as I said, we just have to adjust along the way as we as we uh, uh, continue to to transform the economy. But 
Yes, I, I think it is. I think it is doable. Several banks are currently in focus because of interest rates. In the Philippines, rates are at, I think, 17-year highs. How much room is there for you to cut rates, or rather the BSP to cut rates? We're still battling inflation. Uh, inflation is still our biggest uh, problem. Uh, that we, and when you, when you separate core inflation to inflation that involves agri-products, for example, uh, you can see that the core inflation, we're doing rather well in terms of controlling it. But again, it's these shocks that keep coming in. But still not quite the time to cut rates because inflation is still sticky. Perhaps uh, it, it, we, we look at it all, almost every, every week uh, to see if it's time to, to, to bring down the rates. We are not yet there. Mm. And the peso at a three-month high? Are you comfortable with I'm so, the, the peso? The peso? The peso at a three yes, month because it's an indication of the strength of the economy. Um, there is a downside to it for the Philippines because of our overseas workers, where the dollar is worth a little less than it normally would be. But uh, I, I see it as an, as an affirmation that the economy has, has grown stronger. Um, and that is that's a, all, the, one of those uh, obvious tests. And the dollar, I mean, it, it, of course, because it's a relative, it's a relative uh, measure. Uh, the dollar has not dec has not depreciated. Uh, so if we are, uh, if our the value of the peso is increasing, then that is a good indication that uh, again the economy has uh, has uh, gained strength. Fantastic interview there. The Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. Interesting elsewhere in the conversation, he said that the Philippines standing up to China in the South China Sea is not meant to poke the bear. Great interview from Haslinda Amin there. We've got plenty more still ahead for you, so stay with us. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Let's turn our focus now to the political turmoil in Senegal. The President Macky Sall is defending his decision to delay the country's elections. He insists democracy and its institutions remain intact. Well, for more on this, we've got Bloomberg's Ondiro Aganga joining us from Kigali. Ondiro, given the political instability that we've seen, how is Macky Sall justifying this delay to the elections? Well, he begins by acknowledging that it's been a rough couple of weeks and months in Senegal because he decided to postpone the election not by a month or two, by 10 months. And he said that his main goal was to ensure continuity of peace and stability in the country and ensure that by the time Senegal was going to the ballot, everybody was satisfied with the number of candidates. However, this decision did not lead to the desired results that he had intended for. We saw many Senegalese took to the streets, protest this decision, clash with the police. The government even took it as far as limiting communication by cutting off internet access. And leading to this moment, Senegal was seen as one of the most stable countries in West Africa, a beacon of democracy, and his critics have accused him of attempting a constitutional coup. Luckily, the constitutional Council stepped in and ordered President Macky Sall to set an election date before he leaves office according to the Constitution. We've also seen him extend an olive branch through the political amnesty bill that pardoned all political offenses in Senegal and released opposition leaders like Faye and Usman Sonko. So when we do finally get this election, what are the other candidates offering? Well, we have two leading contenders, Faye and Amadouba, and both of them a day and night. Their policies very different from each other. Amadouba, who's the pick success of President Macky Sall, worked in his government as a prime minister. And so we are likely to see a continuity of policies from the previous administration, which is good for investors. He intends to create jobs, bolster agriculture, and expand the country's infrastructure. On the other hand, Faye is a firebrand. He wants to, one, renegotiate the oil and gas contracts with co companies like BP, Cosmos Energy, and Endeavor Mining. And President Marty Sall says that these contracts can be improved, by, but changing them will be very drastic and will rattle investors. 
OK, well, we'll await that election. Bloomberg's Ondira Oganga, we thank you. Senegal's reputation, as you say, as a beacon of democracy under threat. Now, let's move elsewhere in the region. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the biggest in Africa, is slowly turning the tide from a wave of delistings, with companies once again considering IPOs. Speaking to Bloomberg, the JSE CEO discusses that shift in sentiment. We have actually seen a shift in the tide of uh, listings um, over the last six months. Uh, we see um, a quite, quite encouraging green shoots. There are a couple of themes, a number of unbundlings, and also a number of international listed entities from the London Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ looking to dual list, particularly in the um, resources and also in the property sector. The way in which Amazon um, and other partnerships will enable us uh, to encourage flows on our market is that firstly our technology will modernize we'll um, also be able to reduce the pricing of trading and um, in the other products aside from our back office system we're able to introduce new global markets like the carbon market which we intend to make a pan-african solution um, which would connect with global markets we're also looking looking to, um, uh, to expand our private markets onto the continent. And this would also expand the amount of capital um, that circulates between South Africa and its African neighbors. How soon is the expectation uh, for that? And you mentioned uh, two companies from the NASDAQ uh, and the London Stock Exchange potentially uh, listing. I mean, is that expected for 2024? Yes, that is expected for 2024. So Aurus Resources, um, uh, Vanadium Resource and Marilla Mining have all announced, a. it's in the public domain, a, uh, a, a potential to uh, list secondary list on the JSE. Do you expect even bigger companies to, to try to come to the JSE or is this sort of where you're, you're at for right now? Um, Jennifer, we, we have a history of a large number of dual listed companies. BHP Billiton, for example, opted to delist from the London Stock Exchange and retained its dual listing on the JSE with its primary listing on the ASX. We have more than 30% of our listed entities are global um, large giants. Um, we fully expect as the sentiment and the market starts turning, uh, during the downturn, it was cheaper to raise debt than equity. As uh, inflation is, has increased, rates have increased, it's now becoming a lot more attractive to raise equity rather than debt. So we are seeing a bit of a shift. Macroeconomic uh, conditions, both globally and locally, need to, uh, need to provide a level of stability and clarity. Any uncertainty, of course, is not good for IPO environments. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Now, Hong Kong's fast-tracked new domestic security law is prompting warnings from the US, the EU and the UK. Critics say the global finance hub's new law could censor open discussion. For more, let's bring in our Asia government and economy correspondent Rebecca Chung-Wilkins in Hong Kong. Rebecca, why has Hong Kong moved to pass this legislation so quickly? Yes, this has moved through the Hong Kong legislative system incredibly fast, 11 days, which is the shortest period uh, uh, since the handover back since uh, 1997. And I think in part, this legislation, domestic national security law legislation, is mandated uh, by the basic law itself. So the Hong Kong government has long been obliged to roll this out, but has always faced protests and, and opposition to this. Since the crackdown on political opposition, 
uh, both uh, in terms of within the Legislative Council but also more broadly across the city. That has essentially allowed the government to enact this and roll this through very, very rapidly. And we have seen also some pressure from Beijing to get this done. It is really the last major piece of national security legislation. I think Beijing has been most sort of explicit that Hong Kong needs to push through its system. <laughs> OK, Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung-Wilkins. We'll have to leave it there because we have got some breaking news. Thanks for that story. The news is that China uh, is... Uh, we are seeing US weighing sanctioning Huawei's secretive Chinese chip network. So this is from our reporter Mackenzie Hawkins. The Biden administration considering blacklisting a number of Chinese chip makers linked to Huawei. It would mark another escalation in US pressure on Huawei, which, let's not forget, is a Chinese national chip champion and it's been making technological breakthroughs despite the existing sanctions like the smartphone processor that it made last year that many in Washington had thought was beyond its capabilities. You had Jeffries last week saying that this sort of move would be easy to implement and justify and you've got the US also pressing allies like the Netherlands, Germany, South Korea, Japan to tighten their restrictions on Chinese semiconductor tech. So this breaking headline across the terminal now. While we're talking tech, there's a great opinion piece on the terminal by Shuli Ren on Kathy Wood. Remember, of course, she offloaded NVIDIA in early 2023 and TSMC in late February. She's been sounding the alarm on chip stocks, which resonates with people who worry that we're nearing another dot-com bus, but she hasn't been proved right quite yet. But we'll have plenty more, I'm sure, on that story in the next hour of Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. Jennifer Zabasadja is going to join me from Johannesburg. So stay with us as we look at US equity futures pointing to a lower opening on Wall Street. More ahead, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. It's decision day for the Fed, with bond traders positioning for the central bank to dial back its rate cut projections. In Asia, stocks rise after U.S. equities touched fresh record highs. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is back in the Middle East. This week's trip is his sixth since October as tensions in Israel continue. Plus, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Africa's biggest, says its IPO drought is finally easing. We're going to bring you our interview with the CEO shortly. It is just past 9 a.m. across the Emirates, 7 a.m. here in Johannesburg. I'm Jennifer Zapasaja. And I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Good morning. Welcome to Fed Day. And it's all eyes on the dot plot today. Is it going to be more hawkish? Our market's going to care. We're going to bring you analysis throughout the programme. But first, let's check in on these equity markets. You've got the MSCI Asia Pacific Index flat to the upside. We've had to strip out Japan because they're having a day off. Wish I could have a day off, Jen, every time I'd made a big decision. But there you are. You've got US and European futures pointing to a lower opening. And if we flip the board over to the cross-asset picture, Treasury yields pretty steady. They did, uh, you did see uh, the two-year pushing higher yesterday thanks to the 20-year auction. In fact, I should say that it is closed until Japan, because of Japan, until 11 a.m. Dubai time. Uh, but you have got futures currently steady. The dollar also pretty steady, having climbed for a fourth day. Uh, will we have a dovish Powell in the press conference later uh, affecting the greenback? And then you've got Brent at $87 a barrel. Uh, we have have had this two-day rally, but now edging lower. How high could it go, though, on Fed cuts? We've been hearing from Jeff Curry saying that it could go past 90, and we'll bring you the latest from Sarah Week in Houston later in the programme. Finally, Bitcoin there at $61,727, well off the highs we've seen of late, so taking a bit of a beating. Jen, what are you watching? 
Well, Lizzie, I mean, I think the only thing we're watching today really is the Fed. And it's important to look at really this dot plot because that is of major focus, as you mentioned, with this FOMC meeting. Uh, if you take a look at this terminal chart, uh, it's important to see where we're at right now. At the last meeting, the Fed's outlook for 2024 was three cuts. But that dovish pivot is getting called into question. As you can see right here, the market was expecting more cuts earlier this year. But that shifted uh, to pricing in just under three cuts, if you can see here at the very right side of the chart uh, over the next nine months. Bloomberg Economics back in December projected three rate cuts for 2024. So all eyes will be on what we hear from the Fed. And just on that, you know, we're always taking a look at emerging markets. So as you mentioned, we are seeing a stronger dollar. That stronger dollar continues to uh, insert some pain into emerging market currencies. As you can see right now, the MSCI index for EM currencies down again for a seventh day, extending their longest losing streak since June, but all eyes will be on the Fed and really how that impacts uh, and spills over to the rest of the global markets. Uh, let's stick on the global markets, though, and turn to markets in Asia, where Avril Hong is standing by in our Singapore studio. Hey, Avril. Hey, Jen. Yeah, we're seeing a gauge of stocks excluding Japan taking slightly higher, helped along by some of the tech names, Samsung Electronics among them, climbing by the most in about six months after reports that NVIDIA is considering buying its high bandwidth memory chips. So you can see how the US chip maker, uh, the power of it is really coming through. The other tech name we're watching is that of Tencent. It's expected to show double-digit earnings per share growth, so says Bloomberg Intelligence, thanks in large part to the continued strength strength in its short-form videos. Uh, CSI 300 Hang Seng, we're seeing it back from the lunch break, not giving us that much direction, a bit of green, maybe adding to the signs that we're seeing markets bottom. But let's flip the board because, as you know, it is Fed Day and we want to track what we're seeing in FX as well. Pretty range-bound on the Korean won, the yen. Uh, yesterday, we saw it already weaken to the level that we haven't seen since November last year against the greenback. As we hear from a Dovish BOJ in the face of what's expected to be a hawkish Federal Reserve, guys. All right, thank you, Avril Hong in Singapore. And let's continue our focus on the Fed because it's likely going to avoid signaling an imminent rate cut this week and staying focused on stubborn inflation while keeping one eye on the slowly rising jobless rate. And for more, we can bring in our M Live strategist, Mark Cranfield. Mark, we're expecting a hold, but all eyes on the dot plot and possibly the balance sheet as well. What are you watching? Yeah, not just that, uh, Powell as well. So there's really, there's three big scenarios for traders today. Currency and bond traders, especially equity traders are in their own AI world, so they don't really care what the Fed does today. So the three big scenarios for currency and bond traders are a very hawkish situation, which would be the dot plots are reduced to only two rate cuts. And Jerome Powell does not push back during his press conference. He pretty much goes with the flow. That's the most hawkish scenario. Somewhere in between is the dot plots are reduced to two interest rate cuts, but Jerome Powell uses the press conference to sound a bit dovish and modifies what you hear in the statement. Then the most dovish outcome of all is that the dot plots are surprisingly left at three rate cuts and Jerome Powell gives dovish guidance during the press conference. So there you are, three big scenarios. Depending on which way it goes, we could see a lot of action, especially in the currency market. Dolly Yen is already pushing towards the recent highs. Ministry of Finance is supposed to be on holiday, but they never really are because they're watching very closely. We could even get <laughs> verbal intervention in New York tonight if Dolly Yen pushes above 151, 152 area. Mark, where are you anticipating to see the most activity? I mean, how are markets positioning right now and how are you, or how are you reading into really what could be the response to what we hear today? Well, certainly currency-wise, I mean, the, the dollar yen rate especially is driving so many things in the currency world at the moment. It's getting close to an area which is pretty uncomfortable for the Japanese authorities. So that will be a big focus today where it ends up. And then in the Treasury market, people have made the assumption they've already been betting that uh, yields are going to go a little bit higher. The Fed is going to sound a bit more hawkish, not cut rates until way into the second half of the year, maybe July or later. Now, if there's something to modify that, there's a lot of short positions which need to be squeezed out of the Treasury market. So somewhere between U.S. Treasuries and dollar yen, that's going to be the big swing factor today. And then if you want to go a little bit further, euro yen just hit a 16 year high today. So people also obviously got a lot of interest 
in what happens between the euro and the yen currency as well. Mark, I'm going cross-eyed with all these crosses, but thanks for staying across all the possible scenarios for us. Bloomberg M Live's Mark Cranfield. And we're going to continue our central banking conversation now. We've got Maurice Gravier, CIO for Wealth Management at Emirates NBD, with us in the studio. We're going to get to the Fed, Maurice. Thanks for being with us. But let's start with the BOJ. What's your take? Was it a dovish hike? Is it going to be one and done? Yeah, most probably. I, I think that the, the most important thing is that first, they ended this monstrosity of negative interest rates and, uh, and they tweaked, um, the, they ended most of their unconventional uh, policies, uh, with one exception, which is buying JGB. So I think it's quite, uh, it's of all quite bullish because they, they say more or less, okay, we want this inflation to come back to our target sustainably and sustainably for Japanese people is not two quarters. I mean, it's years probably because we already saw some spikes in inflation in 97, in 2014, above the target. It was very temporary. So they will take their time. I'm not sure they will hike uh, one more time this year, but what matters is that uh, they, will still, they will keep on buying JGBs, so at the end it's good for the Japanese economy. Mm. Well, Maurice, uh, we were just talking to Mark then uh, about the dollar-yen, and really all eyes are on the dollar-yen and what happens today. What, what is your expectation, and maybe since we're still talking about Japan, also yen-euro, I mean, what's, what are you thinking here? My God, it's super difficult to make any prediction on currencies in general. I would say that um, on, a, uh, on a, a bit sad uh, purchasing power parity basis, uh, the yen is undervalued. There's no question. And the dollar is probably a bit overvalued against, um, against everything. But I, I would certainly not, not make any short-term call uh, regarding currencies. I think there was some positioning. People were, were um, uh, expecting this outcome from the Bank of Japan. They were over-positioned and there was a bit of a short covering there. So just to be clear on your expectations from the Fed today, did last week's economic data out of the US change your expectations for the dot plot today? We are uh, extremely constant, consistent in our expectation. We still expect three rate hikes uh, this year, but when it comes to the FOMC, we, we expect some ambiguity because, uh, you know, ambiguity is good. The French president said you only exit uh, ambiguity at your own uh, detriment. So uh, maybe that's what's going to happen. The ambiguity we expect is that first, the dot plot should, should reflect two hikes and not three, but we think that uh, Powell will not push back against the start of the cuts and in the middle of the year. We see no reason for him to push back because, as you said, economic data is not that bright uh, and uh, the, um, the policy is currently restrictive, or probably a bit too restrictive. So they should start, especially as the U.S. calendar in 2024 is complicated with the U.S. election. So it's better to start at some point. So mm. that's what we expect. And it would not be bad. Where does that leave treasuries then, Maurice? <laughs> Again, that's, um, I, I would take the, um, the, the, the a bit surprising instant reaction yesterday uh, in Japanese government bonds uh, to, the, to the BOG decision because uh, you saw that the, the tenure uh, in Japan went down and, uh, and I think it was linked to positioning and to some, uh, some uh, surprise in the fact that they continue their quantitative uh, uh, easing for uh, bonds. I would personally expect the kind of the same. If we are right on what will happen, I think it's... Uh, e uh, it's good for bonds because actually I think that markets last week, you know, with this 20 to 30 basis points increase in U.S. Treasury yields have anticipated a lot and probably maybe a bit more something too hawkish compared to what's going to happen. Well, what's the sort of magic level when it comes to the 10-year Treasury yield and what would disrupt the equities rally? Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley says 4.35 percent. Where are you? Oh, I think that's very accurate. No, um, I would say that the magic level for us to increase duration is probably 4.5%. And we may see that if we have a spike in inflation, which we do not expect particularly. But currently, we are a bit cautious on, on, um, uh, on duration. Having said that, for stocks, the beauty of this year, and that's one of the key points of our global investment outlook, is the fact that we think that bonds and stock will be uncorrelated and that there is no, uh, as long as earnings deliver, and so far they do, uh, with central banks having less leeway, less impact, we think that we have diversification impact. So I don't I don't think that uh, it would derail the equity rally. Okay. Maurice, uh, you and your team have made a tactical asset, uh, changes to your tactical asset allocation. Uh, could anything change that if we hear uh, something from Powell later today that uh, potentially will change what the outcome or, or what the makeup of your portfolio currently is? 
Uh, well, uh, we would uh, first we, we we've just made some changes. We we have um, we consider that visibility is quite reasonable for the coming months. Uh, let's say until the summer. Or so we are not sure what lies beyond. But at this stage, for growth, inflation, and central banks, we think it's pretty clear. So we have added to equities and uh, we have reduced our overweight on gold to put some uh, real estate. Reduce our underweight here. To to make a change, uh, I mean, we would need a big surprise, and I don't think that uh, Chairman Powell will come with the idea of a hike or something like that, which could be the big surprise. But no, we. We, we have no intention to change. We will more react to the price action. We would love to see a correction in stocks uh, to add, probably. That, that, that's the direction we have. And again, 4.5% on the 10-year, we would increase duration, but that's not what we expect now. Maurice, before we let you go, surprise me. What's your most contrarian call? <laughs> Our most contrarian call... Um... I'm sorry, we are very sadly not super contrarian because the, the areas we like, like uh, Japan in developed market equities or, or India in emerging market, this is a bit, um, this is a bit in the consensus. Yeah. But where are the opportunities in EM? India, clearly. Uh, I know that it's, uh, the, it's everyone's darling, it's the most expensive, but you have reasons for that. Should it be the demographics, the growth, the earnings, the quality of the companies? Uh, yeah, definitely. We are neutral on China because it's too dangerous to be, uh, to be underweight, but it's a bit too bold to be overweight. So again, we are a bit in the, in the consensus there, but we are ready to move and to surprise you. All right, playing it safe. Maurice Gravier, we thank you for coming on the show. CEO for Wealth Management at Emirates NBD. Lovely to have you in the studio. Well, we've got a busy day on the docket. It's not just the Fed, Jen. We've also got, back in my hometown, the UK CPI data, 7 a.m. London time. That's 11 a.m. UAE time. And it's going to be an important print, of course, for the Bank of England decision tomorrow. The bank not expected to give more details on the future path for rate cuts when it meets. But this inflation print is expected to show that price grows back on a steady path to the BOE's 2% target. Economists seeing a drop from 4% to 3.5% driven by food, core goods and services. But it's not just CPI in the UK. You've got some near where you are, Jen. Yeah, Lizzie, I mean, it's, it's a busy day for central, it's a busy week for central banks all over. South Africa's CPI, we're waiting for uh, that interest rate decision. And of course, uh, we've been talking a lot in this region about how there's a bit of a divergence with African central banks uh, versus what we've seen with developing uh, markets. And a lot of what we heard, especially from the South African central bank governor, uh, is that inflation is still sticky. And so the question is, what will inflation show? Uh, right now, the expectation for this year uh, is that it dropped to 5.4 percent in the first year in the first quarter excuse me of 2024 from 5.7 percent previously we got that in a survey uh, on Tuesday so the question is uh, what will we get later today and how will that impact uh, the central bank when they meet next week uh, and then we're also uh, waiting for the Bank of England and Turkey as well Lizzie Yes, so the BOE, as I say, expected to hold rates, though we shall keep an eye on the vote split. Will it be a little more dovish this time? Will Jonathan Haskell drop out of those voting to hike? As you say, we get Turkey deciding at 3pm Dubai time. They're expected to hold the one-week repo rate as well at 45%, but continuing to tighten reserve requirements and banking regulations on the side. Then at 1pm Dubai time, we get the Norders Bank decision. They're also expected to hold borrowing costs. So the focus focus instead on the outlook for when cuts are going to start and most economists don't see sooner than the third quarter. And then just to mention the SNB too, 12.30 p.m. Dubai time is the time of their decision. They're expected, <coughs> surprise, surprise, to hold as well at 1.75%. It's a holding party, Jen. What happened to the pivot party? <laughs> well, don't speak too soon, Lizzie. Uh, there's still a lot out there, uh, look, that we are waiting for. But still ahead right now, uh, Senegalese President Macky Sall has defended his decision to delay elections that plunged the West African nation into turmoil. We are going to talk about that. But up first, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will make his sixth visit to the Middle East since the Israel-Hamas war broke out in October. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Now, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken is making his sixth visit to the Middle East since the Israel-Hamas war broke out, with stops in Saudi Arabia and Egypt on the agenda. The top US diplomat has called on Israel to let more aid into Gaza, saying the situation is worse than Sudan and Afghanistan. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's Stuart Livingston Wallace, who joins me in the studio. Stuart, you've got the Israeli delegation headed to Washington. It seems that the feud is easing. Is this just the diplomatic dance or is there actually hope for real change on the ground? I think it's exactly that. It is the dance. Um, and I think both sides have decided they need to tone down the rhetoric a little because it was getting quite ugly. Uh, and I would say, you know, quite shocking in some respects, you know, based on decades and decades of really rather cordial relationships. Not to say they didn't have their disagreements, but it was always kept private. And this really came out into the public domain and I think that sort of gave, gave everyone pause for thought, particularly from the American side, to some extent they're trying to find what exactly is their leverage over Bibi uh, and I think they're really struggling to find it. You know, the, I don't think they have the option of withholding armaments or funding or anything along those lines politically but on the other hand they have a presidential election coming up, we know there are some swing states, particularly Michigan, where this is going to be a big issue. Do they really want to put Biden's re-election at risk for the sake of this relationship. Right. And, and Stuart, I mean, how how are you assessing sort of how both of these leaders, and I mean Biden and Netanyahu, are navigating this uh, now that we are seeing them really sort of walk back this, what you call, ugly sort of situation that the two had been in? So I think the next step, as we see it, is that, yes, Blinken will be back in, in the region for his sixth visit. I think the expectations that he will be able to get a breakthrough are probably quite low, just based on five goes at it and not much happened. Uh, and then the second leg of it is you have this Israeli delegation, uh, one going to Doha to continue these peace talks or the ceasefire talks in, in uh, return for hostage releases. Again, the expectations there are quite low because Israel said very explicitly that Hamas's demands are completely untenable. And then a second Israeli delegation going to Washington uh, during which uh, U.S. officials will try and find some path where they can avi uh, avoid a ground war. So quite what that will look like is, is, is really hard to pinpoint. But basically what the U.S. is trying to avoid here is, um, you know, again, the, the death of great many civilians at the same time meeting Israel's goals of eliminating the Hamas leadership. It's easy to get focused, distracted on the diplomatic story, but of course, as you say, it's really about the humanitarian crisis that's happening. I mentioned Sudan, I mentioned Afghanistan. Can you just spell out for our audience why the humanitarian situation is so much more bleak in Gaza? It is. Uh, I mean, look, Blinken himself said, and he gave numbers along the lines of 80% of the Sudanese population require aid. It's about 70% in Afghanistan. In Gaza, it's pretty much 100%. And I think that's a function of not being able to get much in. So we know they've done some airdrops, uh, you know, which really haven't had that much impact. I mean, clearly better than nothing, not to poo-poo them. But at the same time, there is no grand scale solution yet. You know, we've got a floating dock coming in a couple of months. That's going to be able to get more volume in, but that's a couple of months. And meanwhile, you've got this un back report talking about a much, much more urgent need than that. And no clear solution on the table for how you massively increase that aid. Right. Uh, from the U.N., 100 percent of the population is reportedly in need uh, of humanitarian assistance. Uh, Bloomberg Stuart Livingston Wallace. Stuart, thanks so much for joining us this morning on that. All right. Stick with us. There's plenty more still ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zabasadja in Johannesburg. With the focus firmly on the Fed today, Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan gives us his take on the U.S. economy. Our team was predicting recession somewhere early this year. Um, it didn't. Then they took that off the tables. We moved through the year, and now they're predicting you know, two percent plus growth for this quarter. So you've gone from uh, negative to slightly positive two percent. That is. Returning to the mean, return, it's not you know, outsized growth, it's actually slowing down. So people can't forget we're going from a 4 to 5% growth rate to 2.5% growth rate is slowing down. And, and the 
the restriction on economy accomplishing its purpose. Meanwhile, the consumer is very resilient, and that's providing an anchor to windward that the Fed has latitude that a lot of places don't have, that they can be hold the restrictive and let the economy really catch up. But they have to be mindful of the change. At some point, that consumer will slow down, and they have slowed down their spending. And so last year, it had been 10 percent growth. This year, in the fall, 5 percent. Now it's down to 3 to 4 percent. They've got to be careful they don't overshoot. So th this is the tension we're in right now, which is this resilient economy and actually, as you said, Lisa, actually trying to bring inflation down for since the financial crisis to now, most central banks are trying to get inflation up. And so it's a completely different execution, and, and that's what we've got to get right. You're dominant in small business lending. Yeah. I'm just wondering just how much confidence there is out there still in corporate America at the lower level, in the small companies yeah. across this country. The American economy is the dominant economy in the world right now in terms of activity and interest and investment, and lots of good trends for it. But on the other hand, why aren't they using online so much? It's a little more costly, therefore you're a little more careful. And that's, that's the tension we're going through. Everybody's trying to really figure out how this economy will perform. And you know, four months ago, people worried about a recession. Six months ago, worried about a recession. Now they're not. But now the question is, do they really want to invest heavily in it? And that's where you're seeing a the, the little bit of tension here. So that was Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan speaking there to Bloomberg Surveillance, a special broadcast from the bank's headquarters in New York as we look to equity futures pointing to a lower opening on Wall Street. Plenty more ahead. It's Fed Day. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. It's decision day for the Fed, with bond traders positioning for the central bank to dial back its rate cut projections. In Asia, stocks rise after U.S. equities touched fresh record highs. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is back in the Middle East. This week's trip is his sixth since October, as tensions in Israel continue. Plus, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Africa's biggest, says its IPO drought is finally easing. We'll bring you our interview with the CEO shortly. It is just past 9.30 a.m. across the Emirates, 7.30 a.m. here in Johannesburg. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja. And I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai. Good morning. It is Fed Day and it's all eyes on the dot plot and the presser and maybe a surprise on the balance sheet as well. Are we going to see a more hawkish Fed today and are the markets going to care? We'll have analysis for you throughout the day as we head towards that decision. But let's check in on these markets. You've got the MSCI Asia Pacific Index flat to the upside, higher a tenth of a percent. We've stripped out Japan because they're having a day off after that big day for the Bank of Japan yesterday. Yesterday, but futures pointing to a lower opening stateside and in Europe as well. If we flip the board to the cross asset picture, Treasury's taking a break as well because, as I say, Japan is closed at the moment. But yesterday, you did see Treasuries pushing higher after a pretty strong 20 year bond auction. The dollar is pretty steady at this point as we await the Fed decision. If we hear a more dovish Powell, are we going to see an impact on the dollar? A question for later in the day. But Brent trading at 80 $87 a barrel. We're in the middle of Sierra Week and we'll bring you our interview with Jeff Curry later in the programme. He says that Brent could go to $90 a barrel if you have the Fed cuts uh, boosting the oil price. So we'll bring you that interview. Finally, Bitcoin, $60,914 is where we trade. So taking an absolute beating and well off the highs we've seen of late. Jen, what are you watching? Yeah, that's right. Bitcoin really moving there, Lizzie. Uh, listen, let's go back uh, to the Fed because it is Fed Day, as you mentioned, and the dot plot is of major focus. What we saw at the last uh, at the last meeting, the Fed's outlook for 2024 was three cuts, but then that dovish pivot, of course, getting called into question, as you can see from this terminal chart here. The market was also expecting more cuts earlier this year, but has shifted its pricing uh, in three cuts uh, as it's shifted to pricing in three cuts, just under three cuts uh, as likely over the next nine months. Bloomberg Economics projected three rate cuts for 2024 back in December. So we'll have to see what we get later today. But you were mentioning the dollar uh, earlier there, Lizzie. Uh, the stronger dollar, although we are seeing uh, a steadier dollar right now, uh, still inflicting a bit of pain when we look at emerging market currencies. Uh, right now, the EM index uh, for emerging market currencies is uh, down right now. That's over the past eight days right now. It, it's down about eight tenths of a percent, down for a seventh day right 
right now, extending its longest losing streak since June. But all eyes will be on what the Fed says today and how that trickles uh, across global markets and currencies there. Uh, let's, though, uh, pivot to how markets in Asia are faring. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio. Hey, Avril. Yeah, as we count down to the Fed, let's recap what we're seeing on the monetary front in China as well. Chinese lenders opting to keep things unchanged on the loan prime rate. But if you take a look at the bond markets, that doesn't seem to matter. They're running along with the speculation that we could see some easing coming down the line, especially given the concerns surrounding the property sector. The property debt crisis is now entering a new era where we see all these concerns uh, given the record number of defaults and increasingly all these developers being taken to court uh, and all this related to liquidation orders. So there is that sense that you're going to get support from the Chinese authorities and that seems to be what bond markets are running along with. Let's flip the board and take a look at the FX. Um, as we wait for the Fed, we're seeing it pretty range bound on the yuan. Uh, and there's a uh you know, some corners of the market who believe that the PBOC has very clearly shown that line in the sand of 720 for the onshore yuan. And regardless, these state-owned banks are going to help to prop up the renminbi. So not seeing that much moves on onshore, offshore yuan today. Uh, of course, we're watching out for what the yen is going to do as we keep an eye on what's to come from the U.S. central bank. All right, Avil Hong in Singapore, we thank you for that update on Asia markets. And now we'll switch our focus to the political turmoil in Senegal. President Macky Sall is defending his decision to delay the country's elections. He insists democracy and its institutions remain intact. Let's find out why. Boomerg's Ondiro Aganga joins us from Kigali. Ondiro, we've got so much political instability. How can Macky Sall justify delaying the elections? Well, he begins by acknowledging that it's been a rough couple of weeks and months if we factor in the political volatility that we've been seeing in Senegal. But he goes ahead to say that the reason why he decided to postpone elections, not by one month or two months, by 10 months, was because he wanted Senegal to be a peaceful, stable, and just to be on that trajectory of growth. He wanted that by the time the country is going to the ballot box, the number of candidates reflect the political needs of the people of Senegal. However, that did not achieve the intended meaning. We saw the people of Senegal head out to the streets, protest this decision, saying it's unconstitutional. It led to clashes with the police and also a couple of arrests. And leading to this moment, Senegal was one of the most stable countries in West Africa and seen as a beacon of democracy. And that is why critics of President Macky Sall termed this move as an attempted constitutional coup. And we saw the Constitutional Council step in and order President Macky Sall to set an election date before he leaves office as stipulated by the Constitution. And that's why on the 24th of March, Senegal will be heading to the ballot. Yeah, uh, and Andira, it's hard to believe that's just a few days away. Listen, let's talk about the other candidates because there is a lot of attention being paid uh, to what these other candidates really offer. Uh, I, I mean, dig into some of these, these other uh, people for us. Two frontrunners here. We have Amaduba and we have Fire. Amaduba is a peak successor of President Macky Sall, and his reign will be seen as a continuation of the policies from the previous administration. He wants to focus on creating jobs, bolstering agriculture, and expanding the national infrastructure. On the other hand, Fire is a firebrand. One of the first things that he wants to do is to renegotiate oil and gas contracts with companies like BP, Cosmos Energy, and Endeavor Mining. Something that President Macky Macky Sall says it's not a good indication. These contracts can be improved over time, but changing them all over again will rattle investors. Be that as it may, whoever takes office will have an uphill task. Austerity measures at this point are inevitable because the debt of Senegal has moved from 40 percent to 70 percent. Yeah, uh, all eyes on this election. Bloomberg's Indira Oganga, thank you so much for staying on top of this for us and joining us this morning. Let's turn to South Africa. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the biggest on the continent, says it's slowly turning the tide from a wave of delistings with companies once again considering IPOs. The JSC CEO spoke with me about the shift in sentiment. Take a listen. We have actually seen a shift in the tide of uh, listings. Uh, 
um, over the last six months. Uh, we see um, a quite, quite encouraging green shoots. There are a couple of themes, a number of unbundlings, and also a number of international listed entities from the London Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ looking to dual list, particularly in the um, resources and also in the property sector. The way in which Amazon um, and other partnerships will enable us uh, to encourage flows on our market is that firstly, our technology will modernize. We'll um, also be able to reduce the pricing of trading. And um, in the other products, aside from our back office system, we're able to introduce new global markets like the carbon market, which we intend to make a pan-African solution, um, which would connect with global markets. We're also looking to, um, to expand our private markets onto the continent. And this would also expand the amount of capital um, that circulates between South Africa and its African neighbors. How soon is the expectation uh, for that? And you mentioned uh, two companies from the NASDAQ uh, and the London Stock Exchange potentially uh, listing. I mean, is that expected for 2024? Yes, that is expected for 2024. So Aurus Resources, um, uh, Vanadium Resource and Marilla Mining have all announced a, it's in the public domain, a, uh, a, a potential to uh, list secondary list on the JSE. Do you expect even bigger companies to, to try to come to the JSE or is this sort of where you're, you're at for right now? Um, Jennifer, we we have a history of a large number of dual listed companies. BHP Billiton, for example, opted to delist from the London Stock Exchange and retained its dual listing on the JSE with its primary listing on the ASX. We have more than 30% of our listed entities are global um, large giants. Um, we fully expect as the sentiment and the market starts turning, uh, during the downturn, it was cheaper to raise debt than equity. As uh, inflation is, has increased, rates have increased, it's now becoming a lot more attractive to raise equity rather than debt. So we are seeing a bit of a shift. Macroeconomic uh, conditions, both globally and locally, need to, uh, need to provide a level of stability and clarity. Any uncertainty, of course, is not good for IPO environments. And that was the CEO of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Leila Fori, speaking with me. Uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange, as we mentioned, of course, uh, is the biggest exchange uh, on the continent. Important to take a look at what we're seeing from the exchange uh, yesterday, uh, falling for a fourth day, uh, although uh, Leila there was talking about some green shoots. And if we talk about uh, the biggest contributors to the lost gold fields, uh, really having a, a significant event. Richemont uh, also having a, a pretty, a lot of downside yesterday. And and that is, of course, uh, to coincide with Remgro. Uh, Remgro actually fell 4.6%. Uh, percent Naspers uh, also uh, falling about 7 tenths of a percent. Naspers contributes significantly to this exchange. Uh, so important to pay attention to that. But as Layla noted, uh, they are anticipating more IPOs. For the past few years, they've seen uh, a, a record number uh, of delistings. So potentially, this is the year where we see uh, more spinoffs coming onto the exchange from the NASDAQ uh, from Europe as well. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But that is just a look uh, at the, uh, the closers for some of the biggest uh, uh, for the Johannesburg Stock Exchange yesterday. All right. Stick with us. There is plenty more still ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in Johannesburg. The president of the Philippines says the threat from Beijing's sweeping claims in the South China Sea is growing. But Ferdinand Marcos Jr. told us his government's efforts to assert sovereignty in disputed areas are not meant to start a conflict. We spoke exclusively to him. The threat has grown. Um, and since the threat has grown, we must uh, do more. 
to, to defend our, our uh, territory. And uh, so maybe perhaps that's what, that is, uh, what we people, people are seeing, uh, is that a more robust defense of our, of our territorial rights uh, as uh, recognized by the international community through international law, through the UNCLOS, um, and uh, we, we we hew very close to that. We we do not we do not leave uh, very uh, we do not, we have not instigated any kind of conflict. We have not instigated any kind of confrontation. The but, U.S. has weighed in. It constantly points to Article Five of the Mutual Defense Agreement, mm -hmm. which was signed in 1951. It now says that it now extends to all armed conflicts, mm. armed attacks mm. in all, in any area of the South China Sea. In practice, mm. what exactly does that mean? So I, I, that that uh, an a, a incursion, for example, uh, to occupy, uh, which has already happened, but we are still trying to, 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 to keep it uh, uh, peaceful. Uh, but you see, we are avoiding <laughs> We avoid, as I said, we think about peace in the, in the national interest. It, is, it does not serve any purpose to heighten tensions, to say, OK, I am invoking now the Mutual Defense Treaty. And uh, that, that I don't think anyone wants that, unless you've asked a very difficult question here. Um, <laughs> unless, unless the the effects are such that it is a threat, it, is, it will become an existential threat to the country. Then I think it's very easy to say that, uh, that, 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 would, uh, that would trigger uh, the, the mutual defense treaty, the agreement between the United States and the Philippines. How confident are you about U.S. support? How far do you think the U.S. would go to support the Philippines in the South China Sea? Well, that, that's far. Uh, we we can say that the United States has been very uh, certainly very supportive in every in every way, and um, and it has uh, the United States has really uh, shown uh, that it takes very seriously these agreements that we have, and so but it is dangerous for one to think in terms of when something goes wrong. We'll run to Big Brother. Uh, that, that's not the way we treat it at all. I say we 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 do this for ourselves. We do this because we feel that we have to do it, and it's not at the behest or at the, of, of the United States. Mr. President, just to follow up on that, how confident are you the U.S. is willing to go to war with China over a disputed reef in the South China Sea? Oh God! Uh, you, how far is the U.S. prepared to go? What are your talks suggesting to you? Well, I, I really... Uh, we, we would... To take, the, take the, a step back from that question is that that is precisely what we want to avoid. Uh, we want to do everything we possibly can, together with our partners and allies, to avoid that situation once more. This is, the, this is not... This is not the... Uh, uh, poking the, the bear, as it were. Uh, we are trying quite to, to, to do quite the opposite. You know, we, we are trying to, to keep things uh, at, the, at the manageable level, uh, to continue the dialogues, whatever they are, at every level. And we have initiated many of those dialogues. At the, we have dialogues at the sub-ministerial level, at the ministerial level, and at the executive level. And so, I think that that's what we have to continue because uh, it, it, it would, the, the, there are many volatilities in the area, in the region. So the Philippines saying it is not poking the bear by standing up for itself against China in the South China Sea. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin, who I must say was wearing fabulous shoes there, which is only appropriate for an interview in Manila. I'm sure you'd agree, Jen. But let's turn now to one of the year's most watched IPOs out of the US. It's on the docket for today, Reddit. Jen, I lost much time on Reddit when I was a university student. 
student. But this is a very exciting IPO pricing today and trading tomorrow. Are you a Reddit user? <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not a Reddit user, but I think, uh, you know, everybody who is a, a, a consumer of news knows what Reddit is, especially if we think about Wall Street bets. Uh, and it's really interesting uh, to digest sort of how Wall Street bets is really focusing in on this IPO uh, because, you know, they're actually taking a, a, a bit of heat because, uh, you know, they think this uh, whole entire IPO is, is a bit interesting uh, because, of course, uh, you know, they are behind a lot of the meme stocks, uh, but saying that there's some criticism in terms of, you know, what the CEO has been uh, paid and also uh, Reddit's business structure. So it will be interesting to see how uh, a lot of the Reddit users really uh, comment on what this IPO does and what this company does next, Lizzie. Yeah, it's the perfect point because remember these people who are the Reddit users, who the CEO wants to be owning the stock, 8% of the shares, they are the people who fueled the meme stock frenzy and some of them have already threatened to bet against the company. So this is risky for Reddit. It's going to be an interesting one, as you say, because Reuters has said that the IPO is between four and five times oversubscribed. So that would suggest it's going to reach the price target of 31 to $34 per share. We can can be pretty optimistic perhaps about this but I've also been going through the history of Reddit since it got its start in 2005 I don't know if you saw this Snoop Dogg was an early backer and Sam Altman worked there for just a few days he's still a major shareholder yeah, I mean, the, the, com the company had a, a number of CEOs, actually. It's a re we have a really interesting story on the Bloomberg just about sort of the history of the company, how it was one of the first uh, Y Combinator companies, of course, with Alexis Ohanian, uh, Steve Huffman, uh, as well, as you mentioned, uh, Sam Altman. So there are a lot of names uh, that we talk about constantly today that are a part of this Reddit story. Uh, what will be interesting is, is what will the future be? Uh, and I I'm really interested to see really how Wall Street bets comments on this uh, going forward. But we'll see that, as I say, pricing yeah, today, trading from tomorrow. We'll get across that IPO for you, as well as, of course, the Fed decision. Plenty more still ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zapasaja in Johannesburg. Audi has just launched its delayed electric model, the Q6 e-tron. The CFO of the automaker, a subsidiary of Volkswagen, says he's confident the new car will be a success, but remains cautious about the overall market for EVs this year. He spoke to Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. Take a listen. We are ramping up now the Q6, so the 2024 will not be a year of full availability. Um, the car will be in the market in the second half of this year. So we are ramping up, but we are really looking forward. And my personal opinion is it will be our most selling car in the, in the BEV segment because it's so modern, it's so up to date, it's really a great car. That's quite a forecast. And in the interim, I think we have some issues with the sort of profitability for a lot of car makers this year. Where do you see the margins bottoming out and when do you see that coming back for Audi? Yeah, so this year for 2024, we are a little bit more cautious. You know, uh, there are a couple of challenges, the macroeconomic environment. Um, uh, I think competition also increased even further. Um, we have also some supply issues. We still have some supply issues. That's why we are a little bit more cautious. We expect our return on sales to be between 8 and 10 percent at the moment and our net cash flow to be between 2.5 and 3.5 billion euros. And if the margin is not going to come from the sort of demand side and from sort of the top end, are you looking to cut costs? Where are the savings going to come from? So we just initiated our performance program 14 and we are working on both sides. We are working on the revenue side as well as on the cost side. Uh, on the revenue side, we are going to improve our mix and um, we are going to exploit volume chances wherever possible. On the other, on the other side, we are also working on costs, uh, especially on material costs, product costs, but we are also keeping our fixed costs under control. 
Audi CEO Jürgen Rittersberger there speaking to Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. You've got futures pointing to a lower opening on both sides of the Atlantic as we await the Fed decision. Tom McKenzie's up next to take you through that. This is Bloomberg.